All right, take your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, I warn Sister Pi that this could be potentially be a very long sermon today that I would have to stay on task. If you're watching this on Facebook and we exceed the 30 second, the 36 minute time limit that where they cut off our audio, uh, you can watch it on YouTube as well. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the, um, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him, that you would not so uh, not soon be shaken in mind or troubled neither by the spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showeth himself that he is God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for everyone who's here today and those that, that they have been faithful in attendance. Uh, but the most important thing is that you are here today, Lord, and we just ask that you would bless this gathering, that you would enable me to, to preach and to teach and to expound upon the Word. We ask that you would open our minds, our ears, and our hearts that we might take these things and, and uh, uh, just take them in, into ourselves that we might give you might give us understanding that we, you might change uh, our attitudes that you might change the way we live. We would ask today that this sermon would come as a warning to those that do not know Christ as their Savior that the day is short and that they should uh, the the necessity that they should come to Christ today. Um, I ask that you would forgive my sins and enable me to preach. Just give me a clearness of thought and clearness of word that your word may pre be preached and you might be glorified. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I'd like to preach uh, this morning on falling away. Now many of the sermons you will hear on this passage concentrate on the Antichrist. Uh, and many, uh, uh, and, and perhaps I've even preached on it this self, but you will see from the context that Paul and the, the believers there in, in Thessalonians are actually not looking to the Antichrist or for the Antichrist. They are looking for the second coming of Christ. They are waiting his appearing. He says before that any of that happens, though, there will be a falling away. And that's what I'd like to concentrate on today is the falling away. Uh, that people have fallen away from the things of God. Think people have fallen away from uh, the things that are important, the things that are necessary. Now when he speaks of this falling away... I think the main intent of what he's saying, he's talking about a falling away into apostasy. That there will be false teachers, that there will be false doctrine, that there will be more people that love these false teachers and the false doctrines and, and all these things that uh, appease the flesh And strong doctrine, sound doctrine will be pushed to the side. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, now this, this, this uh, 
thought of apostasy has really been on my heart heavy here these last several months. I believe I, I, I spoke uh, on it last week. But more and more I'm seeing churches that used to be sounded, grounded soundly in the Word of God and in strong doctrine. We're, we're, we're seeing a generation of preachers that come up that are preaching all sorts of things. Um, my old pastor, many have said, well, you know, he's kind of hard on these young preachers and, and he can be outright rude sometimes. I'm beginning to understand why. I spoke to someone a couple months ago and he, uh, my, he said, oh, yeah, I met your pastor and he was uh, found out where I went to college and he was kind of rude about it. And it's because these, these, these churches, these, these schools are turning out Men that are not following after strong doctrine. Ephesians 4 and 14 says, We henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and Cunning, craft, uh, cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. We see an age where people were caught up in every wind of doctrine. Now Paul here I believe is, is talking about the lost people that you know I used to know a guy that I, I remember thinking and maybe even saying to someone He's got no grounding in the Word of God. So everything that someone says to him, he believes. If you say God is sovereign, he believes that. If you say man has a free will and he chooses his destiny, he believes that. If you say you can lose your salvation, you, can, you, you, can, you, can, uh, uh, you can't lose your salvation... He's blown about on every and, and thank God, thank God, this man's testimony now that he is saved. But back, and he would make these professions, and you would listen to him, and you would talk, and you would discuss with him these things. But unfortunately, we are seeing people in our churches now that are just as bad as the lost to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, anything that comes through, anything the the, the new thing, the current thing. Um, Seeing a bunch of these young Christians, and I do believe these people are, are, are saved. And part of the problem is, you, you might recall months ago I preached on uh, uh, my problem with, I think it was uh, the Reformed Baptist or whatever. And basically it was because the Baptists were not Reformed, but a lot of these guys are listening to the, these men that are not Baptist, that are not grounded in the Baptist doctrine, that are not grounded in the Baptist faith, and these men do have a lot going for them as far as a lot of the things they teach. John MacArthur has a lot going for him, but he misunderstands a lot of things about the church. John Piper, you can, you can look at him, but, but he does not understand a lot of the important doctrines. So you can look to these guys as far as their, 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 their stands and get some good thoughts. And you always say, okay, you can glean from these men. If you don't understand the term glean, that was you can get a little bit out and take the good stuff. But unfortunately, instead of gleaning, they're gulping it all down. And they're falling after false things. And they're, they're, they're giving up important things that are important to their spiritual understanding. There is a falling away of apost into apostasy in this day and this time. Now when... Jesus had John send the letter to the seven churches. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you probably already realize that out of those seven churches, two of them he was able to commend 
but five of them he had to condemn. Three out of those five, the condemnation was because of doctrinal issues. Things where they had, had, had turned away. These were, these were churches, the Lord's churches. These were churches. That's why, that's why Christ was dealing with them. It's because they were the Lord's churches. But they had fallen after strange doctrine. They went after strange uh, fire. Paul told Timothy that these things would happen in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. It says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with long, all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, and I believe the time is here, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. The problem is, they hear what they want to hear. They hear what they want to hear. If something sounds good to them, they, they well, that must be good. I was, uh, and I thought about preaching on this at, at, at some point. I was listening to um, um, Brother Joe Collins preaching on the prayer of Jabez, and he, he referred back to that book that many of you may remember. About 15 years ago, a guy named Bruce Wilkinson wrote a, a, a book on the prayer of Jabez. And uh, they, they, they took that little prayer and they made it a statement that you can basically Im improve your, your material wealth and, and everything about you if you will pray this prayer and be, be faithful to keeping this prayer. And there's a great misunderstanding. And a lot of people bought that book and the only person that really got wealthy out of that book was Bruce Wilkinson. Sold millions of copies, and then once you do that in the, in the current religious uh, publishing society, you've got to have follow-up books, you've got to have study guides, and all these other things. But people hear, oh, I can have lots of money, I can have lots of property, I can have this, and I can have that. And that's what they want to hear. There's a verse later on in my notes. I believe it's in uh, 1 Timothy 3 maybe, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But basically it says all that will serve God will suffer affliction or persecution rather. But they hear what they want to hear and they heap what they want. They, they want teachers who will tell them these things. When you go to the TV and you go to the radio, you, you, you see there, there's no shortage of, of men and, and women that will tell them what they want to hear. And those are the popular preachers now in this, in this current age. They hear what they want to hear. They heap what they want to hear. And they have what they want to have. Now, I'm not talking about the, 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 the uh, uh, monetary gain necessarily that they, they promise. Or, 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 or the health that they promise. But they have the exact church that they want. There became, there, there's, there started a movement probably... At least 30 years ago, maybe so. We'll, we'll, we'll just give the people the church that they want. And people started to flock to those churches. 
and joining those churches and you had churches full of lost people. That's the issue. But what's the answer? Paul didn't bring up this issue to Timothy just to say, here, oh, we got a problem. Oh, we got a problem. You know, people, people will, will, will not listen to strong doctrine. They, they, they don't want to hear it. They don't want uh, It's always been that way. Jesus had that problem. He didn't have any problem when he was healing the multitudes, but when he started to teach, they would all depart. Lots of churches, they'll say, oh, we're having a dinner and people will show up. People that, that, that you hadn't seen in, in, in some time, they will show up for a dinner. But they won't show up for the preaching of the word. Now, I'm not anti-dinner. You, can, you, can, you know I'm not anti-dinner. But my goodness, we used to have a, a, a guy uh, up in Ohio. Wasn't a member of the church, but we would have a monthly fellowship uh, every Sunday, the, the, I think it was the last Sunday of every month, where we would have a dinner. And uh, he'd show up. His, his, he didn't come to the church other than the fact that his family was members of that church, but he'd show up. And they got disgruntled. They went somewhere else. They were a group that hopped around from church to church until they found fault with everything, and then they jumped to another church. He showed up. He's like, where's my family? Oh, they left two months ago. So he ate the dinner and left and never came back. The answer is to preach the word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he says, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. People like exhort, but they don't like reprove and rebuke. The answer is to preach. The answer is to reach. Verse 5, he says, do the work of an evangelist. That means spread the word. That means be faithful to the great commission. I don't know about you, but I fail miserably at doing the work of an evangelist. I, I, I'm always praying about it. And I pray that, that, that I will be better at it. Be better at it, but, but I, I confess I need to be more faithful in sharing the gospel with others. You know why these other churches, the, 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 these churches that are prospering are prospering? You say, well, you know, they don't preach the word. They don't preach strong doctrine. They, 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 they have the best music. They have lively music. They have all this stuff. You know, they put on a big show. Uh, they, they, they have bands and orchestras and, and all this other stuff going for them. And they have, they have uh, uh, this group and that group and all these things going on. And that's why their church is growing. They're growing because they are evangelizing their church. They are inviting people to their church. They are uh, uh, addressing, uh, you, you know, we've got something better than come to our church. Our message should be come to Jesus. And if they come to Jesus, they'll want to come to our church. Amen. We have to preach the word. We have to reach the lost. And we have to teach. Titus chapter 1 verse 9. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he might be able by sound doctrine, not just teach anything, but teach sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Chapter 2. He says, but speak now the things that become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. And the aged women likewise 
that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. And it goes on and it, it, it talks about teach the, the the older people need to have an attitude that they are, and uh, that they will teach not only by their words, but by their walk. Jesus didn't just say in his great commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. He says, teaching to them to observe all things. Amen. The reason why we have us falling away into apostasy is because we're not teaching them to observe all things. There's a falling away of affections. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1, for this we know that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bloasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of them that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. One of those things he mentions in there is they're without natural affection. We live in a day where people are without natural affection. They say other than, than the, the, the love of, of God, the love of Christ for his people, the greatest love on this earth is a love for a mother and a child. But we see mothers murdering their babies by the thousands. We see them abandoning them. We, we see fathers uh, uh, leaving their, their, their families. And perhaps some other man raising them. We see what is unseemly with men and women lusting after their own sexes. There's been a falling away in our affections of the things that are important. There's been a falling away of our affections, not towards each other, but in particularly towards God. I, I believe if you read Romans chapter 1, it all comes because we, uh, we as a people have walked away from God. And all these other things have come upon us. In Revelation chapter 2, we're going to talk, hopefully briefly, about a couple of these churches today in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. I might have to have somebody come up here and separate my pages for me. Here we go. Revelation chapter 2. Verses 4 and 5. He's talking to this church at Ephesus. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and, and, and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them that are evil, how that thou hast tried them, which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. In other words, this is a doctrinally sound church. They're not like the churches that we were talking about that, uh, that, that had fallen into apostasy. 
They got all this going for them. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. What is their first love? Their, their first love is what he's talking about. You have left the love that you had when you first met Jesus. When you were first saved. You loved him so much. You wanted to tell everybody about him. You wanted to live for him. You, you, you wanted to, 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 to uh, put away anything that would offend him. But you become cold and indifferent. I was listening to Brother Morton on Sermon Audio the other day, and he was talking about how preachers will misquote this, and, I, and I've done this before. Is that they'll say instead of, you've left your first love, they'll say you've lost your, your first love. He said, they haven't lost it, they left it. And as I was thinking about that, when you lose something, it's either you don't know where it is, or someone is taking it from you. My cousin one time had a hot dog that he was eating on the beach, and a seagull just took it right out of his hand when he was a kid. He had lost that hot dog. When you lose something, it's either I don't know where it is, I've misplaced it, or someone has taken it. But when you left it, you willingly walk away from something. You know where it is. You just have discarded it. You put it away. People have left their first love towards God. They've left their first love toward His church. What do we do? Verse 5, remember therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He says three things. Remember. Remember what it was like. Now, couples sometimes uh, ha ha have become distance, distant, and it's important for them to remember what it was like when they were dating, when they were first married. That's what he's saying. Remember how great it was. Remember and repent. Go back to that. Make a, a, a choice to go back to that relationship. Remember repent and redo go back and do the things you used to do in other words if you were once again talking about a spousal relationship man maybe you know bring the flowers home every once in a while women put on the makeup a little perfume maybe start courting each other again that's what he's saying get back to those things that are important he said, if you don't re remember, repent, and redo, I will remove. I will remove the light. As a church, I will remove the light. I, the, in other words, my presence will not be there. But, and people hear that all know, the, the church. But take it personally. What if he removes the light out of you? That's how serious this matter is. They've fallen away in their affections. They've fallen away into apathy. The other church I'd like to talk about here is Laodicea. Oh, you knew I'd get to Laodicea, didn't you? <clears throat> They've fallen away into apathy. Now, I was listening to uh, Cincinnati Sports Talk. I was up there, and, and actually I still listen to it down here on the Internet. But I was listening to a guy, and he was talking about a, a, uh, the team, and... Uh, the big problem that they've seen, and I've heard them talk this, uh, say things similar to this, is that people just don't care about this team anymore. He said the difference between love and hate, and I don't completely disagree with it or agree with this, but I know the point he's trying to make. If I ask you what the difference between uh, uh, the opposite of love was, you would probably say hate, wouldn't you? He said the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. It's apathy. In other words, if you hated, you would still have emotion. 
Jesus was talking about this church here in Laodicea. He said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're apathetic. You don't care. Revelation 3, 14 through 17. It says, under the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Thou art neither hot nor cold. I would work. I would thou that thou. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, everybody wants to be hot concerning the, 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 the things that they should be concerning. In other words, emotional and caring and, and, and goes back to uh, the first love. But the issue is, you know, we got a, a thermostat over here. What happens is we'll come in and somebody will be cold and they'll turn that thermostat up. And then the preacher gets hot and he turns it down. But the issue is we're either hot or cold and we do something about it. We might button up our coats or we might take our jackets off. But we do something about it. But when we're lukewarm and we're comfortable, we don't care. And we don't do anything about it. He says, you don't care. They do not mourn. 2 Timothy 3.22 I said we get to this. All that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. I've heard preachers say in the last few years it would be good for us to have some persecution. Because right now people need to wake up. The church is like the sleeping bride in the, in the Song of Solomon. We're comfortable. We've settled down. We've got our comfortable bed clothes on. We, we, we've, uh, uh, she's talked about how she, she, she's put her night cream on and she's done everything and she's laid down and she's comfortable and the call has come to arise. And we're lethargic about it. We don't mourn. I'm sorry, we don't want more. Don't mourn is our... In other words, we're happy with how we are. We're happy. We, we, we don't want to, to rock the boat. We don't want any more out of our walk with Christ. We don't want any more uh, uh, out of our, our, our church situation. We're content. We're satisfied. And then we don't want more and we don't cry over the situation. We'll cry over everything. The Wildcats lost. Was it yesterday? You'll see more so-called Christians crying over that than there will the fact that the pews are empty on Sunday morning. God said to Jonah, you care more about that gourd dying that was keeping you comfortable than the thousands of people in Nineveh that were dying and going to hell. They don't want more. They don't mourn and they don't move. If you were hot, you'd get up and move. <coughs> Take your coat off or change the thermostat. If you were cold, you'd do something about it. But week after week, month after month, year after year, we don't do anything about it. We're apathetic. And finally, we're falling away in our anticipation. 
Back in our text in 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from him, as the day of Christ, as at the day of Christ is at hand. These believers were interested in the coming of Christ. As I said, usually when you hear this verse, people want to center on the Antichrist. Paul is addressing that Christ is coming. We don't have, I don't believe, the same anticipation that, or the proper anticipation. I should, maybe we've never had it. In, in the coming of Christ. We say, oh yeah, he could come every day, but we're not really uh, looking out the window. We're, 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 we, we say it, all oh, Christ may come today, but we really don't think Christ is going to come today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing that this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. He talks about the scoffers. Now we think of this as, as lost people, but I think... Christians today are not really looking to the coming of Christ. We're more concerned about political issues. We're more concerned about sports. We're more concerned about everything. Think of all those parables that Jesus told about the master coming back and the servants not being faithful. Not looking for his coming. There are scoffers without, but there are definitely scoffers within our churches. Peter also tells us not only about the scoffers, but the scattered. Verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men would count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The only reason Christ has not come back yet is because not all of his elect are saved yet. That's the only thing holding him back. All the other prophecies have been fulfilled. And when the last of his, his, his elect have come into the fold, he will surely come. We see the scoffers, we see the scattered, and we see the security. He says, God is not slack concerning his promise. The concern here. As people were worried, why hasn't Christ come back yet? This was in Peter's day. He said he's just waiting that all of his people should come to repentance. He has made that promise and God is not slack concerning his promise. In Revelation chapter 2, the very last book in the Bible, Three times he tells us he's coming quickly. Four times in the total of the book, uh, in total in the book of Revelation, but in this one chapter alone, three times, verse seven, he says, "Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book." This concerns our walk. He's coming quickly. We need to walk with him. We need to make sure that we are living for Him. We need to make sure that, that we are, uh, uh, our doctrine remains sound, that our walk remains sound, that our affections remain sound, that we are not apathetic, that we are busy when He comes. 
Which gets into the next point. Verse 12. Uh, verse twelve. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. This concerns our work. We need to be walking with the Lord. We need to be working for the Lord. And we need to be watching for the Lord. Verse 20. It says, He that testifies these things saith, Surely I'm come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Would you stand? If you're here today and you 